Good afternoon and welcome to uh, DB303. Three, yeah, 303. Uh, my name is Dave Dustin and this session is Virtualizing SQL Server 2012 uh, for local and cloud. Um, for the people on the end, I invite you to move on into the middle. Uh, it makes it a bit easier for me to be able to see people if you've got any questions or anything like that, rather than to keep looking at either end of the room. Um, a little bit about myself. There's my contact details if anybody's interested. Um, I do not work for Microsoft. I am a Microsoft SQL Server MVP, uh, and I work for a publishing company, a global publishing company in the DB and data group. So today's session, as I said, is uh, SQL Server virtualization. How many people here are already running SQL Server on a virtualized machine? How many people here are running SQL Server 2012 on a virtualized machine? Why are you here? <laughs> you know the answers already. Um, the common thing is many DBAs and sysadmins still believe SQL won't perform well when virtualized. I've seen a lot of environments where every other machine in the environment has been virtualized except for the SQL Server box. Even if the SQL Server box isn't doing a lot of work, they still say, no, we're not going to put it onto, we're going to keep it on bare metal. Things have changed though. More than 95% of Microsoft SQL Server installations around the world are now running virtualized on Hyper-V. Why virtualize? Economic climate, cost factors is a primary factor, cost savings is a primary factor, primary reason for virtualization. Virtualization lets you run more workloads on less hardware, power savings and improved hardware ROI, return on investment. Consolidating workloads from multiple servers into a single server drives up the hardware utilization rates. There are a lot of, machine, a lot of SQL Server out, instances out there where they're probably only utilizing less than 20% of the capabilities of that machine because every once in a while, say maybe once a quarter, we need 70% of that utilization. But the majority of the time, it's just barely even being touched. Um, those sort of machines are prime candidates for virtualization. This reduces the number of physical servers in your environment and therefore reduces the overall power consumption. The ideal time for doing this is when you're due for hardware refreshes. So old hardware needing to be replaced is the ideal time when you would start to consider virtualization. Fewer servers makes IT administration a lot easier. Um, are there any sysadmins in the room? Okay. From the old days, the old sysadmins used to have to connect to the console of each machine, make sure that there was nothing, no event log errors, nothing, no uh, app pop-ups, no blue screens, no nothing. With virtualization, you have a console, so you can quickly and easily go tick, 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 click through and see if there's anything there. You also have the advantage of consolidated administration panels and dashboards. So you can get an overview of your entire environment on a single screen, so you can say, okay, all of my servers are green, I don't need to worry about it today. Same with um, reporting and, and error logs. You have increased opportunities for high availability and disaster recovery when you virtualize your SQL Server instances. And it also opens up the opportunity for rapid deployment of new servers. So um, I'll come to that in a few moments. Licensing. A lot of people don't want to hear about licensing, but licensing a virtualized SQL Server box is actually easier in many instances. Where you have a lot of instances, you can choose to license the host machine and with the appropriate license rights, all of the SQL Server instances that you apply on that box can be covered by those licenses. So rather than needing to license each individual box, licensing the host can actually work out cheaper in the long run. Or with uh, the cloud-based services such as Windows Azure, uh, you pay as you go. So you decide how much resource you want, you decide how big you want the box to be, how long you want it to run for, and you pay that amount by the minute. Simple. Any questions? Okay, so the two key, two key areas I'm going to cover today are on-premise, or private cloud as it is commonly known these days, um, and cloud-based, so this is systems like uh, Windows Azure virtual machines. I'm not going to be talking about um, SQL Azure, or Windows Azure SQL databases, or whatever they want to call it these days. I'm only going to be talking about SQL Server uh, being installed into a virtual machine, either locally or installed into a virtual machine in the cloud on Azure. 
So installation on premise. There's very, very little difference between the hypervisors these days, um, and there's uh, with the latest generation of hypervisors, very little difference between them. So between vSphere 5, uh, ESX, and um, Hyper-V3, there are different features based on the, addi on the additions you purchase, um, but performance-wise, they are very, very comparable. Um, Hyper-V3 running on appropriate hardware, uh, running on Windows Server 2012 R2, um, has been clocked at 1 million IOPS, so 1 million IO operations per second inside of on Hyper-V. So that is an incredible performance. People are worried that a, that a virtualized, virtual machine isn't capable of performing. They definitely are. Three years ago, you were looking at a 10%, up to 10% of your CPU utilization was lost through virtualization, through needing to provide the virtualization layer. With well, the current systems, that is down to less than 1% in many instances and not more than 2%. So if you've got a fairly grunty machine, you're not even going to notice anything. Um, even though I'm primarily only talking about SQL, tw SQL Server 2012, um, SQL Server 2005 and higher is supported in a virtualized environment. That means that if you have a problem with an install, you can find uh, product support services, and they will support you with that install. Storage configurations. IO is pretty much the same, regardless of if the disks that are connected to the virtual machine are physical or VHDs. There is some differences depending upon the system, depending upon the type of um, the type of infrastructure you've got, and the type of storage it is. But overall, performance-wise, the difference is negligible these days. Use automatic tier adjusting technology if possible. Does anybody not know what tier, tiered storage is? So tiered storage is where you can have, where you may have different types of drives. So you may have solid state drives or you may have memory based drives and you may have rotational drives or you could have um, faster spinning rotational drives and slower spinning. So you get a 15K, 10K and 72K, um, so 7,200 RPM drives. And so you can actually choose the type of data that you're writing goes to a particular tier of data. So something like log files or tempdb, you would want on your fastest disk, and stuff that doesn't change very often, you, want, you can afford to live on slower disk. Primarily in the file server world, but it also plays a good role in the SQL server world, because you can happily put your OS on slow disks, on a slow tier, you put your logs and your tempdb and potentially your page file all on faster disk. Keep OS, data, logs, tempdb all on separate drives if that's possible separate disks if possible. So if you have a very friendly relationship with your SAN admin, if you're not using direct, direct attached storage, um, then try to create the drive volumes on separate disks if possible, um, just so that you are not creating drive content IO contention as you are uh, performing operations. Page file, there's some debate about where that lives. Um, ideally, you want to have enough memory in your machine that you shouldn't need the page file, so it shouldn't ever come into play, but you still need it there as a backup. Storage and duplication. Um, functionally, originally, or only available in SAN system. It's now available software with Windows Server 2012 R2. So this was RTM'd earlier this month. This basically can identify areas of a disk across multiple disks that are the same. So rather than having the same data on both disks, it actually just creates a node between them. And so then that, um, that duplicate data is actually removed and that space is reclaimed for use elsewhere. Um, saves le means less data actually on the array, less read-write operations. Um, it also means that for caching, it only needs to have load up one copy of that file or that block of data and it can be accessed the, the array storage will present it to any access that's required. So as I say, that's now available software inside Windows Server 2012 R2. Same with the tiered storage that is now also available as part of the OS rather than requiring a SAN. Memory duplication. This is where the hypervisor, so the hypervisor is the 
core of a virtualization system that basically provides the layer between the guest OS and the host OS, um, providing the channels between the hardware and the, the OS. Um, many of the hypervisors have an option where if the same pages of memory are exactly the same across multiple running virtual machines, it only keeps one copy of it so that other page, those other pages can be used for something else. Now that's really great for a system where those pages aren't changing very often, say with a file server with, uh, and where you have um, disk caching rather than uh, file server caching. But for SQL Server where you're constantly pushing data into the buffer pool, there is, the plan changes are constantly changing, there's nothing really to deduplicate. You're just putting extra overhead on your hypervisor as it needs to go through and say, okay, does this page match with any other pages in the system? Yes or no, okay, if it doesn't, then don't worry about it. If it does, then, okay, we'll deduplicate it, we'll create, oh, hang on, that page is now expired, I now need to recreate it and such forth. So, um, doesn't work for SQL Server, except under some rare circumstances that I'm not really gonna go into because um, they're not very common. Balloon memory drivers. This is a device driver that sits inside the guest OS that communicates back to the host OS. So it will say, okay, I, will, I need this amount of RAM. So the host says, oh, somebody else is spinning up a virtual machine and it, has a, it needs two gigs of RAM as a minimum. So I will ask all of, my other, all of my other virtual machines that are running, can you spare any RAM? So the host will talk to this balloon driver and say, try and allocate as much RAM as you can. And therefore, once that's done, then the host will be able to say, okay, I've now got that RAM and I'll give it across to this other virtual machine. So on a SQL Server instance, this would mean that the, uh, the memory allocation that SQL's done is now pushed back. So your buffer pool starts getting flushed, your process cache gets flushed, et cetera. And the next time you come around to load stuff and then let's push it all back in. So then SQL has to request this RAM again and you're in a continuous horrible cycle, much like automatic shrink DB. Um, it basically prevents the host from needing to fire up the page file. So um, it is really useful for some systems where you may have a server that has a lot of RAM only occasionally needed. So a file server, a application server, or a server where performance isn't really an issue and it can afford to go out to paging or something like that. So, but with SQL Server, you always want your box to have as much RAM as physically possible. Um, it will find a use for it. So ballooning, turn it off unless it is a box that really doesn't need um, all of that RAM all of the time. Memory reservations. Most of the hypervisors have the ability to say, for this guest machine, it, the OS says, okay, I've got four gigs of RAM, or I've got 16, or I've got 64 gigs of RAM, but um, only physically allocate as much RAM as you really need right at this point in time. Otherwise, just do it dynamically. So as more uh, RAM is required, it dynamically allocates it from the host. This enables you to what they call, uh, refer to as over-provision uh, or oversubscribe your hypervisor. So you could have a host machine with 16 gigs of RAM, but you could have four machines each with four gigs of RAM. So that's your 16 gigs already used up, but the host machine is also gonna need some RAM as well. And what happens if one of those machines, also, you actually decide to make it eight gigs? So you're actually utilizing more RAM than is physically in the box. So you can do that because not all of these machines need that RAM all at the same time. So, but with the hypervisor, you can actually force it to say, no, always give this box this amount of real RAM. Don't try and take it away from it. Um, so yeah, the recommendation is that you set it to, similar to the min memory setting for SQL Server, you set your um, reservation to an acceptable amount. So if you've got a virtual machine with 16 gigs of RAM or 32 gigs of RAM, you think, okay, I can afford occasionally to maybe lose four or eight gigs of that allocation, but so I'll meet my minimum, mem mem minimum memory reservation at eight or 12 or whatever's required. And the hypervisor will best effort always deliver that reservation. You can run into problems where if you have multiple machines all with reservations, you can use up all of the physical RAM on that host environment. CPU reservations, similar to memory. CPUs or the cores on the host environment are actually shared amongst all of the virtual machines. 
So if you have a host machine with uh, two CPUs with four cores, that's eight CPUs available. You've got four machines and each of those is allocated to two CPUs. You've now, each of those boxes is using two, but you still need something for the, for the host machine itself. So you are going to start getting some swapping. Um, or you may have a machine that says, because it's been P2V'd, so physical to virtual, so it's been migrated across to a virtual machine, and previously it was four CPUs, and you made the decision, okay, we're going to still keep it as four CPUs because we need the, the multi-threading. If you don't set a set reservation, then you can actually find that that CPU is allocated is truly virtual. So it is actually partially available, and if it's not actually being used, then that CPU load could actually, the, the the power of that CPU could actually be being used by another CPU, by another host, another guest, at the same time. So this can actually increase the um, amount of load on the box and decrease the performance of your guest machines. Workload requirements dictate the configuration that, um, how you should set that up. So, back to installation. You can't simply just copy or clone an existing SQL Server virtual machine. So say you build a SQL Server virtual machine, and you say, okay, I want to spin up another box. I'll just copy that one, and we'll spin it up, and we'll call it something else. Because you're going to wind up with two virtual machines with the same uh, AD SID, so basically the same identifier. And has anybody here tried to rename a SQL Server instance after it's been installed? Isn't that fun? <laughs> um, yeah, SQL really doesn't like that. It is a pain to do. Um, especially with logins, local logins as well. Um, so, yeah. The best way to do it, to set up a, is set up a virtual machine with your guest OF of choice. So basically you'd launch up your um, Hyper-V manager or your uh, vCenter or whatever virtual machine management console you want. Build your base OS, so be it Windows Server 2012, Data Center or Standard or Server 2008 R2 or Linux, which you can't still see on that, but um, install all the SQL prerequisites for that box. So um, that would be Windows Server, sorry, .NET Framework 3.5 SP1. Has anybody here tried to install Windows Server 2012 or 2014 CP, uh, the CTP on a Windows Server 2012 box? You had it fail spectacularly? By default, the Framework 3.5 is not included in the install. So you have, and if you go find the source for this, it can't find it. You have to manually drop into a console and manually install that feature. It is a real pain. It is fixed in 2012 R2, but it's not fixed in 2012. It's not fixed in 2012 SP1. Um, it may be fixed in a future hotfix, but probably not. So, Install the prerequisites, so get everything else up. Use image prepare to partially install SQL Server. Does anybody know what image prepare is? Has anybody ever seen it before? Okay. SQL Server Installation Center. We've all seen this. Everybody's read every single one of those documents on that first page, haven't they? Nobody's just gone straight to installation and install a new instance. Okay. Down here under advanced. It's an entry down here, image preparation of a standalone SQL Server instance. So what this does, <coughs> see if I can find one, no, I won't bother right now. So basically what this does is it takes the SQL install media and it gives you the installation dialog where you go through and pick your features. And you go through and you configure all of the functionality that, you know, if you're going to be mixed mode, would set your SA password, set everything like that. And then it goes through and does an installation, but it leaves it capable of being modified. So it doesn't set the physical server name values. It doesn't set the administrator names. It goes through and does a whole pile of various um, anonymizations of the SQL install. So all of the binaries are put down and everything else, but it doesn't finalize that install. So it's a very useful feature. Um, most people don't know that it's there because it's down under this advanced tab where most people will only be using this for you know, clustering or 
um, installing off an existing config. Then we use sysprep to anonymize the machine. Are people in the audience aware of what sysprep does? Okay, so sysprep takes a Windows install and basically goes through and anonymizes the machine. So all of the applications that are installed that can be sysprepped, so um, SQL Server 2012 is now more capable of understanding it. Um, things like Office, things like um, the actual Windows install itself, all of the values like the administrator name, the administrator passwords, the SIDs, the machine IDs, the server name are all nulled out effectively. So it then writes that information back to that image. So when you shut that machine down, it's, it's now in a sysprep state. So the next time you boot up, it's actually going to say, OK, what are you going to call this machine? What's your administrator name? What's your administrator password? Let's go through and finalize the machine. It doesn't have a machine SID. It's not registered against AD. It's not registered in DNS until it, re, until it redoes that install, the finalization phase. So this is ideal for creating a template. So the next thing we would do was create an unattend XML. So unattend XML is basically a set of operations that will be performed on a sysprepped machine. So it's an XML file that you just go through. Has anybody here done unattend installs for SQL Server? So that horrible text file that most of the features that you can actually use aren't actually listed in there. So um, unattend XML for Windows is very similar. You go through and add in your time zone, your passwords, what domain to join, any of that sort of information. Um, and so the next time that machine boots up, it will go through and perform that operation. If that file is not there or components of that file are not there, then you will pre be presented with the appropriate GUIs as required. This file is just stored in the sysprep folder of that image before it's turned off or finalized. So once that image is created, you just save this off as a template and put it into a repository or whatever you want to work with. So to bring up a new server, easiest way to do it, if you don't have Virtual Machine Manager or vCenter or other such systems, would be to copy paste that image, that VHDX, um, dump it down where you want it to be, launch your Hyper-V Manager, create the new virtual machine, attach that disk, tell us what sort of drive it is, amount of memory, and then spin it up and you're away. And your SQL server is installed and you can start using it. There are a lot of really, really good PowerShell scripts out there to fully automate this process. So you punch in some uh, configurations. You say, OK, spin up a new SQL box based off this template. And it's created a new virtual machine and registered it and started it up and it's ready to go. If you have licenses for SQL, um, system, system Center Virtual Machine Manager or, v, or VMware vCenter, then you can actually take that template and actually include it into the gallery. I don't know what it's called for vCenter. Um, and from there, you can pick and say, create a new virtual machine based off this template or using this disk image. Some of the benefits. High availability. You can move guests from one host to another host to perform maintenance. So if you have, two, if you have multiple virtual machine hosts, and there is a connection between them using uh, vSphere, sorry, vCenter or Virtual Machine Manager, you can actually take that running virtual machine and copy it across onto the other host so you can perform maintenance on that host machine. It could be that um, this machine needs more RAM in it, so we're temporarily going to copy it over here, shut that machine down, throw some new sticks of RAM in there, maybe add some new disk, bring it back up and push the machine back over. It can also be used if you need to apply Windows updates. Everybody knows that Windows Update was yesterday? You all applied all your updates? Anybody else's Outlook broken because of it? Um, so when you, re when you make modifications to the host, it impacts the guests. If you need to reboot your host machine, all of the guest machines on there are going to need to be rebooted as well. So this is where you want to migrate these across onto a secondary host so that you can perform your maintenance on this box while they're all over here. Once it's back up, you migrate the things back, and you're away. And then you can perform your maintenance on that other host. Um, On-premise virtualization gives you disaster recovery of sorts. So you can make snapshots of a, running of a virtual machine before you make alterations to it. So you want to say, OK, I need to apply Windows updates to this, this guest machine. How about I make a snapshot of it before I get going so that if anything goes wrong, I can roll back 
we haven't lost anything except for any data that was entered during that time, but you would normally have a maintenance window. Virtual machine backups means that you don't actually need to physically back up that virtual machine itself. You still want to do your SQL dumps because that way you have control over them, you've got the granularity that you want, but you can actually, just, if you back up from the host, most of the systems will just create a delta. What has changed on this virtual machine? So your OS isn't going to change every single day. Um, you're going to be ignoring things like your page file and your Hibernate file and stuff like that, so they'll automatically be excluded. And that can all be managed from the host. The guest doesn't need to worry about it. It just says, as I'm going, just back up what's changed. There we go. Troubleshooting. You're running into a bizarre circumstance where a problem is only occurring on one machine. You can't replicate it in dev. You can't replicate it in QA. It's only occurring in production. You can make a live clone of that production box, ring fence it so that it doesn't clash when you actually make it available, connect to it, perform these operations, see what you need to tweak. Do we need to change some um, trace flags? Is there something different between this box and something else? And you're impacting on production at that point in time. You're working on a standalone instance. When you're finished, you can just throw that clone away. Very, very useful. One point I'll make around snapshots, except for Windows Server 2012 and SQL Server 2012, Microsoft does not support a machine that has been reverted to a snapshot. So if you have a machine that you've performed operations on it, you've rolled it back using a snapshot, and something else goes wrong with the box, and, and product support services finds out, they have the opportunity to say, no, we no longer support this box. You will have to pay regardless of it is, if it is a bug that you have found. Um, because we don't, because something else could have happened because of that snapshot technology. Windows Server 2012 and with SQL Server 2012, that is a supported configuration and they do support uh, snapshot re uh, revisions, reversions. Some caveats. Virtual machines may get migrated to different hosts with different specifications. So you could have a tier, you could have a range of host machines, different CPUs, different amounts of RAM. And while you need to migrate for a particular reason, you know, because we need to perform maintenance of this, the box that it's migrating to may not have as much RAM, so you may run into problems with, okay, we now have got too much RAM allocation, so we're running, um, uh, things are being impacted. Um, or there could be more machines, there could be more guests on this box than you were expecting, so there's just other load that wasn't expected. With um, many hypervisors, there is also the ability for them to be configured for automatic migration. So a box could identify too many things are happening on this box all at the same time, performance is degrading overall. I'm going to pick a couple of VMs and I'm going to migrate them across to a box that isn't doing anything at, the, at this point in time. So this can actually be done completely automatically by the system. The sysadmin has no knowledge of it, the DBA has no knowledge of it, all that's happened is this box is now over here, and the only way you find out about it is when you bring up your management console and say, oh, this occurred. And that box could be a different spec from what you were expecting. If you're lucky, it's a better box, and then you can say, keep it on this box forever, thank you very much. But if it's on a, if it's on a lesser box, then you can have, um, could run into problems. If server resources are being shared, it could impact your workloads. One of the key things that you do whenever you deploy a new box is you run a baseline. What does this box perform like in this state? Then we do some changes. What does the box perform like in this state? In a virtualized environment, if you're using shared resources and shared disk, then you could find that, okay, it ran really, really well this time. Next time we run it, it runs really, really badly. But that's solely because somebody was also doing transferring three terabytes of dodgy movies into the file share. Maintenance on the host will impact the guests. So, as I said, if you perform operations on the host machine, be it adding new virtual machines, cloning things, um, the guests can be impacted by that. Any questions? Yep. The um, network house, network configuration affect, uh, SQL and so the question is, how does network configuration affect SQL and things? Again, network is a shared resource. Um, it's shared amongst all of the machines. Basically, you need to ensure that you have enough bandwidth available. So, the um, again, this is one of the things that you can't actually 
easily constrain. You can't say, guarantee to give this guy always a gig of, of bandwidth. Um, yeah, you, so you can do NIC teaming, you can use 10 gig E um, NIC cards. Um, there are lots of options for just trying to distribute it. But it is just, again, it's one of those things that you just need, do need to worry about. Anything else? You can cluster with virtualization as well. So clustering is totally a supported configuration with virtual machines. Sorry? Uh, yes. So 2008R2 um, is clustering is supported inside a virtualized environment. I cannot talk to 2008. 2005, definitely not. Um, so yeah, and it can either be with, um, so are you talking about SQL clustering or are you talking about Windows clustering? So SQL clustering with a, with a single shared disk. Yeah, so that is definitely a supported configuration with uh, Hyper-V V2, not with Hyper-V1. So Windows Server 2008 R2 does not support this. Windows Server 2012 does. Any other questions? Okay, keep moving on. Windows Azure. Demo. So how many people went to... Actually, I'll get rid of that one. I'll do this one over here. Excuse me for a second. I'm not going to do what Pat did during his session and make my password publicly available. <laughs> so there we go. So Windows Sure virtual um, the interface. So one of the features of Windows Azure is the ability to spin up a virtual machine. And there is a gallery of templates available. Has anybody here played with Windows Azure virtual machines? Have you seen it demonstrated before? OK, so what we have here is the Windows Azure dashboard. Basically, this shows you all of the options that are available. So we, you can have a set up a website, so an application website, so you can build an app and deploy it to the cloud virtual machines, mobile services, so you can build an application or a data service that pushes out information to um, a phone, iOS, Android, etc. It's what is used to provide the push notifications for most of the Windows Phone 8 and Windows 8 applications. Um, Windows Azure SQL databases, so this is SQL Server in the cloud, not running inside a virtual machine, this is Microsoft running SQL Server, and you create a database and you can connect to it using a internet connection string, and so forth. But, what we have here is virtual machines. So I've got one already up and running. So, But to create a new virtual machine in the cloud, we go new, virtual machine from gallery. So here, for, here we can choose what sort of virtual machine we want to work with but, um, out of the box. So we can have Windows Server 2012 data center, the new Windows Server. You can see SharePoint here. So we have SQL, we've got BizTalk. And down the bottom, we've actually got Linux installations. So if you wanted to spin up a Linux box, you can. And then you can install your Linux apps so you can run an Apache server or whatever. So you're not having to pay licensing on these. All you're paying for is just the, the virtual machine compute time. Visual Studio Ultimate, if you want to do some dev work and don't want to install it on your local machine. So up here, we have SQL Server. So at the moment, we have uh, SQL Server 2008 R2. and SQL Server 2012 with SP1 and SQL Server 2014 CTP1. So those are the three versions that are available. If you wanted to do a different edition, you could create a blank Windows Server installation, provide your own upload media. So you could log on to MSDN Downloads or something like that, pull the ISO down, attach that, and do the install, or copy the bits up somehow, or RDP in with local drive mappings. There's lots and lots of options on how you can make those bits available to that VM and do an installation. So you could put down SQL Server 2005, SQL Server 2000, whatever you wanted inside that environment. So what we're going to do is we're going to pick a 2012 SP1 Enterprise Edition machine. The nice thing about these templates is that they are updated automatically. So the template is always current. So it has the latest Windows update patches already on it. So these templates, so when I go next, we'll see here this machine was actually re re updated on the 6th of August. So later this month, that machine will also be updated again with more information. 
It doesn't apply any of the cumulative updates or any custom hotfixes. If you want to apply those to it, you need to do that post-installation. We set a machine name. We set a size. So you can define how big you want this virtual machine to be. So extra small is a single shared core, which means that you are basically you, you don't have a dedicated core. It's being shared amongst many other boxes. And 768 megs of RAM. That include, that's the OS and SQL, so it's how much RAM is actually in the, in the virtual machine. So you can't do much with that really, but um, it's enough to get you started with a very small, you know, say maybe a SQL Express instance or something like that. Um, the bigger the system you go, so up here we've got an 8 core, 56, gig, uh, 56 gigs of RAM box. So the more or less you pick, it changes the pricing you pay. So, so we'll just do it as a small. Set a username. So this is all web-based. So create a new cloud service. Ah, so the other thing to remember is that this is all at cloudapp.net. So your name needs to be unique. So So that one's fine. So nobody else has got that a virtual machine with that name. If you destroy that machine, then that name becomes available again. So um, if you don't, if you only want it for now, and then you blow it away and bring it back on later, then it's there. Subscription type. So you get different types of subscriptions. Different regions. So which data center do we want this virtual machine deployed to? So you can choose North Europe, West Europe, East US, West US, Southeast Asia, East Asia. New region is coming online at some point. That will be Australia. There's also going to be more um, other geographic regions as well. So, but Australia should be hopefully online by the end of this year, um, and that will hopefully improve performance for Australian New Zealand customers. At the moment, I'm just going to use Southeast Asia storage account. So, this is basically a amount of disk for this account. So, where is the, where are these drives being stored? Um, so this is just a use all my generated and availability sets. So availability sets is similar to cluster is a concept similar to clustering. So you can actually bring up two virtual machines in the same availability set. You can set them with a shared single disk, so that you can have one machine as set as, as active. And if you choose to fail over to your other machine, then that machine is automatically is then becomes the active and can access that shared disk. So it's a it's a really good way of implementing clustering in the cloud. So go next. Choose how what um, functionality we want. So out of the box, we get remote desktop and PowerShell access. You can bring online additional services. So FTP, SSHTP, HTTPS, so whatever you want to put onto this box. So if you're going to be deploying reporting services onto this box as well, then you want to enable HTTP and HTTPS. If you're going to be um, enabling other services, because it is because it is a virtual machine. Anything you can do on a normal Windows install, you can do inside this thing here. So if you want to install Perl, if you want to install P PHP, if you want to install Apache, anything you can do on a normal box, you can now do on this box. All this template does is says, here's Windows Server, and it's already got SQL installed on it as well. Same as if, you, if um, you're going to be creating an availability group, you'll need a domain controller. So you would create a, a base machine with Active Directory services on it. So we're just doing those two by default. And we go away, and it starts provisioning it. So this is basically what it's doing now is the Azure backend is taking that template, making a copy of it, putting it, creating the um, storage area. So another storage area will come online in here. But for now, I'm just going to connect to this box. So what we have here is a SQL. This is my test box that I spun up earlier on. And you can see an overview of what this box has actually been doing recently. So how much CPU it's been using, how much network, how much disk access there's been. So we've got all of these things here, so we can highlight or remove anything we want. Network out. CPU. So it gives you a dashboard information. You can do monitoring, so what it's, what's actually happened on this box over time. So this is all recorded. Um, and you can scan it across 
up across the past seven days. That information is exportable for you to do local um, tracking as well. Endpoints, so we've currently got those. And configuration of the machine, so what, what size it is, RAM, etc. Going back to the dashboard, we can just go down here to connect. And Any questions about this so far? Sorry, yep. Mm. Yep. Okay, so the question is about licensing, one of my least favorite topics. Um, the question is if you create a virtual machine off the SQL Server template, Yes, you are being charged an additional fee for the licensing. It is still charged per minute. It is not charged per day. So um, if you have the machine up for 20 minutes, you are charged for 20 minutes of virtual machine, Windows, Cal, and sorry, Windows Server License and SQL Server License. If you spin up a blank box, so a, a, just a standard Windows install, and you install SQL Server yourself, if you have software assurance rights on your, on your local SQL Server licensing, then you can use license transference to say, or license trans, uh, transportability to say, I'm taking this license from my on-premise environment and applying it to my cloud instance. So therefore you're using an existing license, so therefore your costs are cheaper. So we can see here we have Windows Server 2012 instance. Go to the dashboard, don't see anything. SQL Server Management Studio is there, already and running for us. So we now have a SQL box ready to go. So it's very, very cool, very, very simple. So that takes about six minutes to spin up that machine and it's ready to go. And then you can start creating databases, um, restore backups, whatever you need to it, however you want to work with it. You can, for things like backups, if you create another storage blob in your Azure account, you can do a database dump from your SQL VM across into that storage block. Those storage blocks are incredibly cheap. Um, Dandy Ween was saying he's got about 16 terabytes of storage and he pays about $6 a month for that. So, and there is no cost for data going into an Azure instance. So if you have a local backup of your database, you can transfer that up to your Azure blob at no cost other than whatever it's going to cost you for your internet connectivity. And then from there, restore from that blob into your SQL VM. And so you've incurred no costs on Azure for that. If, however, you do a backup to that Azure blob and then download it to a local machine, you're going to be paying per gig for that data to come down. And here we are, we're connected to a SQL Server 2012 standard instance in roughly less than 10 minutes all up. Quite cool, isn't it? The nice thing about the per minute charging means that, what's the state of that machine? Still provisioning. I can go back to my dashboard, my virtual machine. So that machine is running. I can choose to shut down. Yes. Okay, once it shuts down, the billing on that machine stops at that minute. So I'm no longer billed for anything more for that. Right. Yes. Yes, you could use uh, a script and you could use PS shutdown or something like that internally on the application. You can't do that from the Azure instance, but, sorry, from the Azure dashboard or anything like that. But you could set up, um, does anybody here know the, the PS tools from Sysinternals? So there's a series of really, really cool tools PS shutdown, PS exec. Uh, Proc Explorer, so Process Explorer, things like that. PS Exec is a really, really cool tool that will let you execute a command on a remote machine in the console. So you could say PS Exec, uh, PS Shutdown on this remote machine, and it will shut down at whatever time you want or such forth. So, or launch a command shell on this machine, launch Notepad, type this in, delete kernel32.dll, whatever you want from your local machine.
All right, go back to here. See how we're doing for time. We've got no time at all left, have we? Does anybody know when this session finishes? It's 10 past four, isn't it? Yeah, okay, cool, so we've got about 10 minutes left. So, any other questions on Azure virtual machines? Yes, it is. So all of the components of the of a standard SQL install are there. So basically, your analysis services, uh, integration services. If you're using 2012, you get um, data quality. And the installation center is there, and the install media is also available. So you can add or remove any components you don't want. Uh, it's not configured by default, so it's just installed but not configured, so you can therefore go in and change how you want that configured. Same with the reporting services, it's installed but not configured, so you can therefore change it to SharePoint integrated or whatever you want to do from there. Um, so because it's, a share, because it, you've, it's SQL licensed, it means you've got access to those tools. If you don't want them, then you just turn them off. You don't need to delete them, they're only using disk space. It's the same as if it was a, the question is if you, if you had enterprise edition, if you chose an enterprise edition VM and you wanted to downgrade that to standard edition, is that what you? There is no method in SQL Server to downgrade your edition. So if you have installed an enterprise edition box and you want to downgrade it to standard edition, the only way to do it is to run setup and reinstall SQL on that box. You can't change, you can upgrade, you can go from standard to enterprise, but you can't go from enterprise down. You also run into the problem of that your database may have been created with enterprise only features, and they won't work when attached to a standard edition box. So, so, are you, yeah, so if you already had a standard edition box, you can upgrade that because you've got the install media. If you've got an appropriate enterprise edition key, you can do an in-place upgrade using the SKU upgrade. But only if you had standard edition. If you have um, enterprise edition already installed, then you're stuck on enterprise edition. If you wanted to do any other edition, then you would need to basically spin up another machine, do a migration across. Um, BI edition is not available at this point in time. I'm not sure what the schedule is for making that available, but the functionality is there in either standard or enterprise edition. Any other questions? No, so there's no automated um, scaling. So if you wanted to upgrade it, so you add more RAM, add more um, CPU or something like that, no, there's no ability to dynamically change that. Uh, I honestly don't know. It shouldn't do because the additions of, actually there will be a problem with SQL Server Standard because it doesn't support a hot add, but Enterprise Edition will. The OS editions all do support um, hot add. So you may need to reboot, you may not. It's not something I've act actively tried. Um, but the capability of, change, of changing the size of your VM install is there. You just click and choose apply. Thank you. So if you wanted to use your own counters, so if you wanted to run Procmon inside it, or run Procmon locally and connect up to pull the counter information down, those options are available to you. I don't know off the top of my head what those um, relate to, but probably it's total. So total CPU, total RAM, total disk I.O. Any other questions? Um, No, it's nothing like that. So, um, probably around about 368. So, if you're not doing anything with it, um, maybe 512. It depends on the applications you're running, what else, what else you're running on the box. You can choose to do a core install. So, Windows Server 2012 came with an option for Windows Core, which means no GUI. So, it's a command line. So, you boot up the machine, you've got a GUI. So, you've got to do everything through PowerShell or through the um, Windows Server shell commands. Um, it is a really, really good way of reducing the footprint, reducing the amount of memory required for the install, um, while still providing the ability to run pretty much any application under the sun. 
So any .NET application, so IIS, um, Exchange, SharePoint, you know, that will all run under Server Core. And SQL Server 2012 is the first edition that will happily run on that, on that core environment. So moving on. If you've got any more questions, feel free to come ask me afterwards. So there are other cloud providers that do provide SQL Server on the cloud. So Amazon actually offer two different options. So Azure, Amazon Web Services RDS, which is the equivalent of Microsoft's Windows Azure SQL database. So that's their instance of SQL Server. You attach a database to it and you connect to it. You've got EC2, which is basically their ability, their equivalent of virtual machines. So you can actually create a Windows machine inside there, install SQL Server and such forth. Rackspace are now offering both options as well. So they're running a hosted SQL Server instance and virtual machine. VMware, um, the data director, is their variation on um, a SQL database. And there are numerous third party providers that either offer virtual machines or um, SQL Server directly. Licensing gets interesting on some of those um, where you need to transfer all your licenses to it to be able to utilize it. Managing and monitoring, I'm going to have to quickly go through these because we're almost out of time. So if you've got any questions, feel free to hit me up later on. Management is pretty much exactly the same as maintaining a physical box. So you use Event Viewer, you can use Process Monitor, um, you can use, don't use Task Manager because with inside the guest machine, Task Manager is reporting based upon what the guest OS thinks it's got. So it says, okay, I'm using 50% of the CPU, but in reality on that host box, it's actually only using 10% of the CPU because all of these other machines are utilizing, or it's, got, it's been reserved for this amount. Same with the amount of RAM. You know, it could be saying, I'm using 100% of my RAM, but that's because you've got ballooning in place. And so um, something else has kicked in. So process monitor, so Procmon, using the appropriate counters on a virtual machine, will actually interrogate the host to get real counters, so get real information, not necessarily just what the OS is telling you. Um, it applies to both on-premises and Azure Virtual Machines. Azure Virtual Machine is effectively just a remote machine. You can connect to it, you can enable RDP to it, you can enable R um, RPC to it, so if you want to uh, use SMB, if you want to do anything to it, all you need to do is create a VPN or open it up to the public so that you can get to it. Um, once the machine is built, it is your responsibility to run Windows updates. Microsoft do not apply anything else to that box. Basically, it's your box now. You have complete control over it. Microsoft will never log on to it, so far as we know. Um, they won't do anything to it. So if you need to apply Windows updates, it's your choice. If you want to apply cumulative updates, it's your choice. Snapshots before applying changes. So you can create a snapshot of a local virtual machine before you make changes, so if, before you do uh, Windows updates or before you apply a service pack or before you do some other operation. Just remember that unless it's Windows Server 2012 with SQL Server 2012, it is not a supported environment if you revert back. PowerShell is probably the best option for managing multiple servers simultaneously because you can quickly and easily discover all your SQL Server instances on an environment and perform a series of operations on them. Say, so, okay, how much free disk spaces are on this machine? How much CPU have you used? What are the long running transactions? How many deadlocks did we get? So all the information can be collated locally and reported upon. Monitoring. Five key areas you need to monitor. So not just SQL Server, you also got to monitor what's happening in the guest, or what does the guest think it's doing? What is the hypervisor doing? So has the hypervisor done anything like, has it transferred this machine to another host, et cetera? What's the state of the host? How much RAM is the host using? Has it, has it had to page out because we've, we're over contention? Um, how's the storage doing? Is there any bad blocks starting to show up? Are we getting disk IO contention, et cetera? So you need to work with the system administrators. If you're working with a SAN, you need to work with your SAN admins to get that information out. Um, if you are a DBA that doesn't need to worry about anything of that, all you need to worry about is what your SQL Server is doing and the normal monitoring you do and you trust that the virtual machine is going to run happily and, you know, everything's cool. Tools for this, so Hyper-V Manager, so the, basically the Hyper-V Manager that comes as part of Windows Server 2012, 2012 R2, Windows 8 and Windows 8.1. So for those of you who don't know, Windows 8 uh, Pro and Windows 8.1 Pro both include Hyper-V. Um, so the same Hyper-V engine that is in the Windows Server product is actually in the client machine. So you can actually build virtual machines and run them on your local laptop or whatever and transfer those up to the server. So it's a really, good, it's a really cool way for somebody to take a copy of a 
production instance of a machine, drag it down to your development laptop, test some stuff out, and figure out if, uh, if it's, how it's working. System center, virtual machine, so if you have access to the center, system center suite, uh, with System Center Operations Manager, Virtual Machine Manager lets you perform a lot of really cool operations on the virtual machine, such as the live migration, such as um, deployment from templates, etc. VMware vCenter is similar to Virtual Machine Manager, it's basically for managing a whole pile of ESX or VSX instances. SQL Server Management Studio, you can connect to an Azure, so the SQL Server instance that is on that Azure virtual machine is just a SQL Server instance, it's not a special database, so you would still connect on, what's the port number? For a prize? Who said that? Let's remember to have some prizes to give away. Yep. So you would just open up that endpoint in your Azure machine so that you can then access. Just remember that once you've opened that up, that port is now exposed to the world. So maybe you don't want to use that port, maybe you want to use a different port and use port mapping or something like that. But system server, so management studio can manage those just fine. Ops Manager, if you can afford the license, very, very cool and very easy to uh, keep a track of all your instances. So just some quick screenshots. So for those of you that haven't seen this, this is the System Center, sorry, the Virtual Server, oh, I can't remember, it's basically it's the ability to group a whole pile of SQL Server instances and uh, manage and monitor them all as one. I just can't remember off the top of my head what it's called. Hey. Okay. No, it's not Management Data Warehouse. No? Yes, Utility Center is what it's now known as. I'm trying to what it was called before that, back in 2008. But yeah, so System Center Operation Manager. So here we have a dashboard showing what your overall environment's looking like, what are your boxes. You'll see if there's any errors or um, warnings coming up. This is a really cool plugin, the SQL Server DBA dashboard. So this um, does queries across to your SQL instances, pulling information from the DMVs and storing, the, storing this information locally. Um, I've got links to all of these in this deck, so when you download it um, next week, you'll be able to get links to a lot of these products for trials and stuff like that. So this is a really cool free um, plugin. Um, SQL Sentry's console, so again, more monitoring of your SQL Server instance. This is virtual machine aware, so it knows that when it's running inside a virtual machine, it can appropriately accommodate the CPU utilization disk and stuff like that. This is a cool little uh, SQL monitor tool that I found. Basically it runs as a screensaver on a machine and it just gives you an overall status of what your environment is looking like. And VMware vSphere. Any questions? No. So the, if you, um, what we've done is installed the, uh, installed a virtual machine in the cloud. So it is, it's just like having a virtual machine sitting in a different data center. Yeah. Yeah, so you can set up, a, you can, they, they, Microsoft offer um, a VPN gateway, so you can either install a VPN client on your laptop and connect to it, or on a local server and connect to it, or you can actually build up a VPN box and create a permanent tunnel between Azure and your local premise. And then you don't need to worry about making these ports available to the world. I'll, I'll, I'll come back to you after this. Yeah. So related content, um, DBI 13.13, sorry, 3.13, performance tuning, SQL Server in Windows Azure virtual machines. So this is about interrogating this information and such forth. Um, I highly recommend that. At the end of the day, we've got migrations to SQL Server. So this is, are you running a DB2 or Oracle or Access or other stuff such, or Excel? How do you get that information across into a SQL Server database? Uh, and tomorrow, data mining is easy. Why aren't you doing it? And very cool, 400 level session, performance tuning analytics services. So please fill in your evals. It's very important to the speakers. It's very important to the event. Um, you can win prizes. And I thank you and hope you have a good rest of the day. If you have any questions, please feel free to come up and ask. <laughs>